WordPress, the passionate WordPress educator, one of the kindest, nicest people you will ever get to meet in real life. I hope that you get the chance uh, in one of the WordPress events. And he's also a developer advocate at Human Made. Uh, Mike and El Eleanor are going to talk about um, ethics and artificial intelligence. Without further ado, we're very late, so I'm going to disappear from the screen and I'm going to head it over to both of you. Uh, enjoy your session. Thank you, Petya. Um, so, yeah, um, as Petya mentioned, I'm a developer advocate at Human Made and co founder of the WordPress Software Project. And I'm particularly interested in our session um, as someone from multiple minorities. I have concerns about the internet's strong biases being inherited by these large language, uh, large language models uh, trained on that same internet. So um, I'm really pleased to be talking to Dr. Eleanor Drake today. Um, she's a senior research fellow at the uh, Lever Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence, amongst other roles, and co-host of the Good Robot podcast. Um, can you tell the audience about your various roles and your areas of focus and interest? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here today and um, obviously to be speaking with you. I, I said to you before, but I had no idea that WordPress had um, the ethos that it does. And it's really exciting to um, encounter more companies that actually behind the scenes have been sort of unsung heroes of um, open access or, or various um, pro-justice ways of thinking about technology. Um, so I do a number of different things at Cambridge. Um, apart from the podcast, which is kind of fun, it was our way of talking to our, our heroes during lockdown when all the philosophers were eating cornflakes in their dungarees like everybody else. And the rest of the time I do, broadly speaking, two different things. I focus on technologies that are deemed high risk by the EU AI Act, so stuff like um, hiring technologies and also technologies used to track and monitor protests. And I use feminist ideas to explore um, the claims that they make about how they work and whether they do actually do what they say on the tin. And then I also am creating an open access tool that will be free um, with an AI service provider in Italy that um, also has a similar ethos and specializes in education. And what we're trying to do is um, imbue this very dry bit of legislation with some pro-justice soul and see how we can integrate some feminist and anti-racist ideas into um, the way that people respond to the EU AI Act, and that will be coming out shortly, probably in the next year or so. Okay, okay. very interesting. Um, a central question in your podcast is, what is good technology and is it possible? Um, it is a fascinating question, and it's one that feels especially poignant given the rapid development we see seeing in AI right now. Um, when you reflect broadly on AI history to date, how do you feel about the models we've built? Well, it's a miracle that they work on much smaller computers. <laughs> it's not really what I'm supposed to say as an ethicist, but there is something quite special about it. If you look back at the Ferranti Mark I, you know, in Manchester in the 50s, mm -hmm. there's photographs with only a, you know, several people who are responsible for looking after this absolutely monstrously massive, unmovable machine. And now there's GPT for everybody to use. And if you have enough compute power, if you have um you know the ability to get access to wi-fi and, and etc um so that's that is an extraordinary thing and you know i think people don't really appreciate how long it's taken because it does seem to be very much overnight but the first ai video game was on that computer in the 50s um and the first bit of ai generated music i like this question of what makes good technology because some people come on the podcast and they answer in the abstract you know, a lot of the time you get philosophers thinking, you know, what does it mean to be good? And those questions are really important as well. But equally important are people who come on and say, look, I'm a type one diabetic. And for me, my glucose monitor is a good technology and that it, it keeps me alive. It's very much um, part of my existence. And it's only good when the cap stays on and when it falls off, you know, it's no, it is no longer good. Equally, we have people um, coming on who've worked for an organization called Masakane, and they try to improve um, the way AI processes African languages, over 2,000 languages spoken by huge groups of people um, across Africa. And this is sort of an example of leaning in, you know, being um, asking for inclusion or demanding inclusion. 
but equally we have people who say no we need to um we need to lean out we need to back off get off social media um and people who uh, argue for moratoriums so there's many different paths towards good technology i don't think there's one particular route i think all of these things need to happen at the same time all these different approaches and um part of what we're trying to advocate through the podcast is how to have more feminist conversations that listen to different people's ideas about what we need from from good technology um and the other thing that we think about is how uh good technology is good non technological processes it's good um it's good uh, labor um practices it's it's responsible um the the responsible creation and sustainable creation of of silicon monocrystals of all the other um components that care about not just their their most valuable consumers but all um potential consumers um it's it's responsible clients so all of those those things go into making technology good mhm mm thank you um so what are the main biases that you see in the current ai models um and the, and in particular the ones that are the most concerning yeah so bias is the big thing right at the moment and yet i interviewed engineers at a big technology multinational the size of facebook and i said you know what is bias to you and often they said that it was the um intercept between the y and x axis that they weren't sure which kind of biases they should be um optimizing for or against and defining it mathematically mm. and i think this is really important because well you know we we it's not that because i'm an ethicist my definition of bias is more important or more valid than theirs what we need to do is create concepts and and terms and ways of thinking about harms that are actually meaningful to engineers and evidently the kinds of language that we're using isn't working but i think you know i'll come back to that a bit later what i was saying before about you know it matters who you're selling your ai product to if you're working with the police and you've got um a piece of technology that claims to be able to predict pr protests before the fact and the police um are using that to detect blm protests um or left wing protests then is that bias perhaps not in the way that we think about it but those are harms and those kinds of harms occur in deployment and in deploying technologies in those kinds of scenarios that ends up influencing the way that technologies operate because the data from those protests perceived to be dangerous because it's about perception rather than observation is fed back into the system and then those systems identify future crowds that look similar to BLM protests or have similar slogans and hashtags as dangerous um there was also we were trying to kind of influence the way people were thinking about what could and couldn't be biased mm -hmm. um by redefining what biased data looked like because for many engineers biased data was data that had personal attributes in them so mm -hmm. people race or gender or um disability and they didn't think that the wikipedia data that they were using was biased but wikipedia is largely written by white men for well about um men and those kinds of inequalities are structural they're a, a bit they're bigger than just um the kinds of biases they were looking for mm -hmm. so we really need to broaden our understanding of what bias looks like right yeah so um so it seems like you're saying really that certainly at the beginning ai is very much uh, a tool not necessarily a perfect tool but in particular some of the ways that tool is being applied some of the ways it's being used and in particular the fact that um ai is relearning or newer models are relearning based on the output of the earlier models is tending to then perhaps in introduce or reinforce biases that are already there because they're predicting results based on the bias that are there and then those results are used to then further train um is that the type of thing that 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 you're really seeing yeah but when we say tool i think we can think of ai as something that is just something to be wielded you know it's very much separate from the human the human you know uses the the cup or the you know the glass or whatever when actually 
since our inception, we have become human through our use of technologies from you know, fire, if you buy into the myth of Prometheus who steals fire from the gods and gives it to humans because we were so poorly adapted to our natural environment. You know, we need roofs and glasses and stuff where animals are very well um, adapted. So we have adopted tools mm -hmm. where other creatures have just adapted to the environment. So technology is part of our humanness. Um, and I, you know, acknowledge that every time I put in my contact lenses or take my vitamins or, you know, th these are all put in my retainers for my, you know, teeth. Um, these are all things that that we need. Um, but there's some people who experience that, 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 see, that feel technology as having this very intimate relationship with them more than others. Mm -hmm. But we need to realize that it's not about wielding the tool. It's about positive relationships. Um, with technology and acknowledging its central role in what it means to be human. Okay. So I think um, perhaps as, as a general uh, population, we need to become more, we need to understand AI more, understand um, some aspects of the, of the technology and how it interacts with our lives. And um, I think we need to in part have the right language because the language seems to be very technical at the moment whilst the examples aren't, the, lang the language I've talked about. Um, do we have the right language now, or do we need to evolve our language to, to talk about AI and how we use it and how we should approach it? I think the language is evolving, um, but we're getting a lot of new language that we might be thinking twice about, like hallucinations or AI lying or frontier models, foundation models. There's a lot of quite hyperbolic language around mm -hmm. AI in a lot of language that um, that personifies these systems that make them seem human. And these are choices, right? Yeah. And they're part of the design choices of GPT that make it seem like we're interacting with an autonomous being when we're interacting with hundreds of data labelers, um, you know, silicon monocrystals and all these different um, human and non-human elements that go into making something, you know, speak. We, in our center, we try not to use this kind of language, and instead we think of lying and hallucinations as um, as errors, um, mm -hmm. as kind of malfunctions and, and problems. Um, we also caution people and their use of the Terminator metaphor. And it's interesting because when the media talks about AI, really what they're talking about when they're thinking with the Terminator metaphor is artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether people really acknowledge the difference beyond AI um, and philosophy communities between AI, this thing that does lots of mundane, quite banal behind the scenes things, connecting networks to engineers at telecoms companies um, from actually the autonomous <laughs> robot uh, that does not exist yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's we need to separate the two. Um, the other thing that's really important is when we think about words like recognition, facial recognition, mm. uh, these tools don't recognize or observe so much as create um, what they're trying to perceive. So before I was talking about technology that tries to identify what crowds are going to become violent and mm. now used in the UK and were used in the US. And instead of observing a potentially violent protest. They are predicting through the data that they were trained with, through the ideology of the client, in this case, the police, to, um, to project all those ideas onto an image of a group of people. And it's the same with facial recognition in a lot of contexts, um, or even gender recognition, this thing that obviously is absurd because gender cannot really be recognized um, through the face. So I think we need to be really careful, but also perhaps regulate the kinds of words that are used because those words are really powerful in carrying ideas, presumptions about what AI can do. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's glad you mentioned regulation because I know there are some regulations around and you, you mentioned the, the, the uh, area that you've been uh, working with the EU. Um, do you see regulation or how do you see regulation playing out in regard to the direction AI heads in, and do you think we'll have an in, have international agreements on regulations in the future? All, all very you know great questions. 
at the moment, there's a big gap between the EU AI Act and the regulation proposed by the UK government, which is very pro-innovation, very popular with companies, um, but doesn't have the same um, strength in its obligations at all, which means that people in the UK may be at risk from AI companies that aren't as ethical. Um, equally, um, stuff to, uh, that's created in the UK can put other people at risk um, globally. So I think this is a really huge problem and it's going to be an issue really with every kind of regulation that the EU was really strong with that the UK wasn't like equality regulation more broadly. Um, mm -hmm. The EU has a very strong set of fundamental values and principles. The UK does not. Uh, we were brought forward. We were really modernized by the European Union and now we are at risk of falling behind. So this is not just about AI. This is about mm -hmm. um, all kinds of legislation. And we're seeing at the moment what I think about is regulation nationalism so companies define uh, countries defining themselves through the way that they're regulating ai mm -hmm. and this is going to be a real headache for companies globally um, and also citizens to try and understand what their rights are and the lawyers will profit you know they will probably do the best um, <laughs> out of this whole thing i think what we're really trying to do with the eu ai act is to also integrate ideas like AI can't be neutral ever. Data is never neutral or raw. It's always selected and processed. And these ideas can at least give the people creating systems a sense of, okay, my model will always be a reduced vector space. It will always be a simplification of the complexity of the world. What kind of angle do we want to take? Do we want to reproduce the, un the unequal status quo or do we re want to re reorient it? Um, towards justice. And there's a lot of really cool work at the moment, quite radical work on um, stuff like algorithmic reparations. Um, obviously, reparations are, are still hugely controversial, especially in the UK. Um, but those ideas are being applied to algorithms. We need to, to repair the evils of the past to the evils of the present in order to create a better future. And so it's really exciting and encouraging to see a whole generation of computer scientists that are really engaged with politics and see politics as connected um, with the engineering of systems where once engineering and mathematics were sort of neutral disciplines and then, you know, you left your politics at home. Uh, great. That's, 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 really, uh, that's really good to, to know and to hope um, things are going to get better. Um, Almost my, well, my last question, um, how can we as developers, purchasers, and users of AI technology act? Um, and what kind of decisions can we make to ensure that we back ethical AI in the future, given that regulations do take a long time to come um, and often even longer to enforce? Yeah, great question. It's encouraging to see also the rise of unions in tech. Um, alphabet, etc. cetera, um, workers who are really taking a stand. So if you work in technology, join a union um, and feel as though you can look into the technologies you're building, ask questions, why am I building this? What for? What's the purpose? Because without the people like that, Cambridge Analytica would never have been outed. Um, create relationships with, with journalists looking into technology. Um, just to see how they're reporting, what kinds of things they're interested in, join companies that are meaningful to you. But also, um, we, when, when you're looking into procuring technologies, trust your judgment, your hard-earned expertise. If a technology is advertising itself in a way that seems like it's too good to be true, it probably is. If you're an expert in recruitment and a company is claiming to strip race and gender from candidate profiles and you think that that's probably not possible, um, you know, trust your instinct just because it's AI. Don't throw away all the knowledge that you had. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, I, I know you're constrained for time, so I just wanted to check whether we've got any questions from the audience that we can uh, put to you. Uh, we do. Mike, would you like to ask them? They're in the Q&A oh, yeah. tab on the right. Yeah. Um, okay. So this first one from uh, Jordan Kurtz. Are there certain tasks or functions AI should avoid because of the bias it may have? 
Oh, that's a great question. I would say there are particular institutions that have, should avoid using AI for particular things because of the bias that they have. Mm. For example, um, the UK police struggles with a number of issues. Um, it is not ready to use AI because the organization is not um, yet equipped to be able to use something that will do whatever it's currently doing at speed and scale. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, and this next one is from Marco Jimenez. Uh, are there any progress or conversation about government legislation taking, IA, talk, uh, taking AI into consideration, either as a subject to apply legislation or AI as an influence in the way legislations are made? So I know you've mentioned uh, some progress. Do you know of other things that are that are coming along? There's some smaller bits of legislation from different countries, but I'm not sure how influential they'll be. I think what will end up happening is that maybe the US um, and the EU have quite influential legislation, um, and then other countries will spin off of those um, or just kind of take bits and pieces and um, maybe elaborate on some bits and not others. I mean, they were just an extraordinary amount of work, and really the EU has the resources to be able to do that, um, but very few companies, uh, countries can. So I think that really they'll just be copy-pasted um, in a lot of cases, yeah. Um, also, I think on the previous question, and what we need to avoid is AI being used for things that it can't do. So um, we need to debunk pseudoscience in AI. AI cannot uh, read personality. It can't read... It can't strip race and gender. It can't mm. read gender from the face. Um, so those kinds of applications of AI need to be clamped down on uh, for okay. sure. Thank you. Uh, so this next question is from uh, Pavel. What would be the three things you'd hope developers and the people building AI tools bear in mind in relation to avoiding bias? I think the most important thing that developers should be aware of is that AI isn't neutral, as I said, so it's not objective. And to accept that and just think, OK, I'm going to have build a system that is influenced by where it's taking place, by the organization, by the institution, the incentives. Um, and am I OK with that? Uh, how can I change that for the better? So. With bias, the idea, I think, amongst lots of technologists is that you can t extract it from the system, that it's a sort of bug, a literal bug that you can, you know, pick out. And in some cases, you know, I, I'm not against um, fairness metrics and different things. I think, you know, they can be really useful. But the problem with bias is it's about structural inequality. So you need to think a bit more broadly to that. So um, and look at more at downstream effects. So I really hope um, that developers in the future um, I know I know people do have external interests and do have knowledge about the world, but they connect those things with the job that they're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think last one, if you've got time for this, um, are there, uh, so this is from Jordan Kurtz, are there certain tasks or functions AI should avoid because of the bias it may have? And I think you've covered a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I think that's the last question from the audience. Um, um, I was just going to say, uh, hopefully we'll be um, sharing information about where people can get in touch with you if they want to follow you and follow your podcast uh, after this event. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for uh, coming on and uh, answering these questions. Um, it's been fascinating. Um, and um, yeah, again, thank you very, very much. Well, it's my pleasure. I've actually got, I'll put a link to the hot takes in the chat because um we do this thing called Good Robot Hot Takes, and I think that that's probably the most accessible um, thing that we do. But yeah, um, it was a real pleasure. Thanks so much for, for, for chatting to me. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Thank you both for being with us. Highly recommend the hot takes uh, by the Good Robot. Uh, as I said in the beginning, it's been really, really fascinating listening to that content, and I've never kind of um, stumbled upon anything that is so relevant to the topic really um thank you so much uh for being on uh any follow-up links we can also share through our social channels um have a good wonderful afternoon everybody and uh we'll see you in the next session thank you bye bye